So here in 14.4, we're going to be talking about other antimicrobial drugs. So these are non-antibiotics, uh, meaning bacteria-related, but we're relating these to other pathogens. So first, what we're going to talk about um, are our antifungals. <clears throat> but the reason that we have this separate and why it's in 14.4 is, as we mentioned in 14.3 regarding antibiotics, is that when we are approaching making an antibiotic for bacteria, um, they have a lot of different structures compared to our eukaryotic cells. Um, however, it is difficult to develop drugs that are selective for fungi, for protozoa, and helminths, because remember, they are eukaryotic just like we are. So it's very difficult to um, make something that's going to effectively kill off the pathogen and not effectively kill off our cells. So <clears throat> also, what's difficult to make... Um, antimicrobials for our viruses. And remember, that's because viruses replicate inside of our human cells. Um, so it's very difficult to, to get some sort of antimicrobial to kill a virus because it's inside of our cells. So somehow we have to get that um, drug into our cells to then try to get rid of the virus. Um, while we do have antivirals and while they do work in various ways that we'll talk about, um, if you think about the virus that is free outside of our cells before it infects new cells, sure, we can, we can try to come up with ways to get rid of those, but uh, the, bulk of the, back, or the bulk, bulk of the viruses are going to be inside of our cells replicating, and so we want to try to get something in there uh, to stop that replication, which we have done, but it can be very difficult. Uh, so <clears throat> there are antimicrobial drugs that target them, but they are fewer. So the first ones we're going to take a look at are antifungal drugs. So the first way that we can make antifungal drugs is through disruption of the cell membrane. And this is because we find a difference here. Recall that in our plasma membranes, we have lumps of cholesterol. Um, this is a sterol, the biological molecule is sterol. And the, the sterol that's in our membranes is cholesterol, but the sterol that's in the fungus cell membrane is ergosterol. So it's slightly different. You can see here's our cholesterol and there's the ergosterol. So uh, still a sterol, which means it has these rings, but it looks slightly different. So we have been able to develop drugs that are able to, tar to target this ergosterol synthesis um, rather than cholesterol. Um, so it is selectively toxic. So we're selecting to be toxic to one particular thing. So our first group are the imidazoles. <clears throat> so they disrupt ergosterol synthesis. So we're talking about, um, at this point, this type of drug is going to be interrupting the synthesis of it. Um, so here are some examples of our imidazoles. It's used medically, um, but it's also to keep seeds and harvested crops from molding. So this is applied to crops and seeds so that we kill off the mold, but we don't kill off the actual seed um, or the crops. Also used for fungal skin infections, so ringworm, athlete's foot, jock itch, et cetera. Uh, we have our triazoles, which are another type of antifungal. Again, it disrupts ergosterol synthesis. Uh, this has more selective toxicity, so it's just it's able to attack ergosterol synthesis a little bit more. Um, because keep in mind that even though we are targeting ergosterol synthesis, which is a difference between ours, it is very similar. Um, their cells are very similar to our cells when we make cholesterol. Um, so these do, these antifungals do still cause harm to our cells, um, not as much because it's going directly toward the ergosterol synthesis. So in this case, the triazoles are more selectively toxic and then therefore we have fewer side effects. So they're a little bit more um, narrow. Uh, fluconazole is a common one that is used, uh, taken either orally or intravenously. <clears throat> and it's commonly used because it's used for systemic yeast infections. So um, things like oral thrush, which can be common, and cryptococcal meningitis. And this is where we see um, it, where we see it used often is in AIDS patients. Um, because it is more selectively toxic and has fewer side effects, um, AIDS patients are able to take it without damaging their cells so much that their immune system can't handle it. Uh, the next group are the alloamines. These inhibit an earlier step in ergosterol synthesis. So we didn't talk about the steps specifically, um, but these also are going to inhibit the synthesis, but just at a different step. Um, so another way, similar to what we spoke about with the antibacterials, where we can go in and we can attack one step in the process of making folic acid or the nucleotides, or another step in the process, or we can use both, and then it can be bactericidal. So we can see the same with these allylamines, is that they're going to attack a different step or inhibit a different step. 
Um, our Lamisil is an example of that. It's used topically or orally. Uh, it does have a side effect of hepatotoxicity sometimes used for these types of uh, fungal infections. We also have our polyenes. These are naturally produced by some actinomycete bacteria. So again, we're getting a lot of this from our actinomycetes. <clears throat> in this case, however, rather than going in and inhibiting steps of ergosterol synthesis, what this does it, it is our polyene is this really large molecule, uh, lipophilic, meaning fat-loving, so it's, it's a fatty molecule. And what it does is it binds to ergosterol ergosterol. So when it is synthesized, it binds to the ergosterol. And then that ergosterol is going to be incorporated into the cell membrane of the fungus. And then what it does is it creates these big pores because it's not supposed to be there. So it creates these pores and then it's going to kill the cell. Uh, an example is nystatin used topically for yeast infections in the skin, mouth, and vagina, but also for intestinal fungal infections. So the next antifungal drug is amphotericin B. Uh, this is used for systemic fungal infections, so rather than our topical fungal infections. Um, but it does have the side effect of nephrotoxicity, so toxic to the kidneys. Flucytosine is another one. In this case, we are not talking about interrupting ergosterol synthesis in either of those two places that we've already talked about interrupting ergosterol synthesis. And we're not talking about it globbing on to ergosterol. Uh, and then creating pores in the plasma membrane. But in this case, with flucytosine, what has happened is when the antimicrobial, the antifungal, gets into the cells, it's actually converted by one of the fungal enzymes into a toxic product. And then this toxic product, when it's inside of the cell, is going to interfere with DNA replication and also with protein synthesis. Um, so a lot of times this is used with amphotericin B, uh, so the amphotericin B can get uh, in the system, throughout the system. And then the flucytosine, um, while it can also go throughout the system, is going to hopefully get inside of the cell and then stop that DNA replication and protein synthesis so that it's um, not able to reproduce. Um, so one that can go in and kill off the cells and then the other one that's going to slow it down. Again, there are side effects, however, with nephrotoxicity, um, but then also bone marrow depression, so decreasing of that bone marrow. So some other um, antifungal drugs are echinocandins. These echinocandins are actually going to block the synthesis of beta-glucan. Uh, beta-glucan is something is a molecule that we find in fungal cell walls. Um, we don't have human cell or we don't have cell walls on our cells. <clears throat> so that is a big difference between even though they're a eukaryotic cell, remember, um, they actually have cell walls. Remember, it's made up of chitin. Um, and then we have this beta glucans. Uh, so in this case, our echinocandins are going to go in and they're going to block the synthesis of the beta glucan in that cell wall. And if it's not able to make beta glucan, then it's not able to make the cell wall and then the cell will die. Um, an example of that is caspofungin. So that's used to treat aspergillosis and a systemic and systemic yeast infection. So uh, somebody takes that. So the idea is that it's going to affect that beta glucan. So it can't even make the cell wall. So down here at the bottom of the uh, screen, I think is a, a nice <clears throat> uh, general overview of some of the ways that we can affect um, fungal cells. Um, just kind of touching on some of them. We're going to talk more about them, but inhibiting DNA and RNA synthesis. So we just spoke about flucytosine and how it gets in there and affects that. Um, and then what we're going to talk about next is this disruption of microtubule function. The griseofulvin um, is going to get inside the cell, and then we have our microtubules. Remember, that's part of our cytoskeleton. It's going to affect the cytoskeleton of um, the fungal cells, and that will cause them to, to have issues and then also inhibit mitochondrial function. Um, naphtho naphthoquinone is going to go in and affect the mitochondria. So it's inability to make ATP and then make copies of, um, or have the energy to then go through and make copies of itself and make more cells. Um, so even though the image down here, the reason that I brought it up was really to kind of take a look at this to remember um, that we have our plasma membrane down here. We show that ergosterol is down here instead of cholesterol. Um, and then we spoke about inhibiting er ergosterol synthesis. Um, so that's down here as well. <clears throat> we talked about disrupting the plasma membrane with the polyenes. Uh, 
Um, and then next, we're also going to talk about inhibiting chitin synthesis with the polyoxins and nicomycins. So here are the polyoxins and the nicomycins. <clears throat> These, as was mentioned in the previous image, are going to target chitin synthesis. So remember in the cell wall, um, our fungal cells have a cell wall and they're made up of chitin. And so that again is a difference between our cells, so we're going to try to attack that. Our polyoxins are often used to control fungi in agriculture, so spreading it on crops and seeds and things to try to make sure that um, they don't have mold growth. And then we have nicomycin Z uh, is for use in humans, for yeast infections, and then also for valley fever. Uh, we have griseofulvin. <clears throat> this interferes with the microtubules, as we said, that are involved in that spindle formation during mitosis. So it's part of the cytoskeleton, but then also, even more importantly, when it's trying to divide and make more copies of itself um, through that when we have that spindle formation to grab onto the chromosomes and pull them apart in mitosis, um, it's actually going to interfere with the building of those microtubules. Uh, so then if they're not able to go through mitosis, they can't make more copies of themselves. So this is given orally um, and to treat skin infections when something else has failed. Um, because if you can imagine, if this is interfering with microtubules and microtubule formation, all of our cells are going through mitosis as well. So we don't want to be affecting our cells going through mitosis. So this is kind of one of these things that we would use at the end because we don't want to affect ourselves as well. And so there is a lot of hepatotoxicity associated with that because, again, it's, it can be damaging to our cells as well. Uh, the next ones are anti-metabolites. <clears throat> so as we mentioned down here, inhibiting our mitochondrial function, naphthoquinone um, is one that does that. So this is an analog, so something that looks similar, in that it competes for electrons in the fungal and protozoal, so this is for protozoa as well, um, in the electron transport chain. So again, as we're making ATP and we're going through that electron transport chain in the mitochondria, this is going to compete for electrons. So if it's competing for electrons, it's stealing the electrons away from the electron transport chain, then we're not going to get that gradient. And if we don't get that gradient, we're not going to be able to make ATP, or rather the fungus isn't. And so then if it's not able to make ATP, then it's not able to divide and make more copies of itself. So moving into antiprotozoal drugs, we have anti-metabolites. So again, anti meaning against and metabolic processes. So in this case, we have otovaquone. This is going to a block or going to block the electron transport. Um, in this case, it's used for uh, protozoa, but it's also antifungal. So um, we have that crossover used for these different um, things here. We have proguanil, which inhibits folic acid synthesis, so similar to the antibiotic that we spoke about or the two antibiotics that we spoke about that are going to be blocking synthesis of folic acid. So this is similar, but it works with protozoa. So we can combine this with otovaquone for malaria treatment and prevention, and this is actually what malarone is, which is the pharmaceutical that's sold uh, for malaria. Uh, we have artemisinin. artemisinin. Um, which is another antimetabolite. This is metabolized by target cells to produce a reactive oxygen species, or an ROS, remember ROSs, um, that are going to damage the cells. So remember that our reactive oxygen species is something that we need, that our cells have various enzymes to break down because it damages the cell. In this case, when we give this um, antiprotozoal drug, it's actually metabolized, and once it's metabolized, it actually produces reactive oxygen species so that it will damage the cell. Um, so we can use this for malaria as well. So used with other malarial drugs um, to increase the usefulness of malaria drugs because we see a lot of drug resistance in malaria drugs. Uh, we also have our nitroimidazoles. <clears throat> These become activated and then introduce breaks in DNA. Um, so as the antiprotozoal drug gets into the body, uh, or into the cell rather, not the body, but into the cell, then it's going to become activated in there, and then it's going to start breaking apart the DNA. Um, we can use a couple of these together uh, for things like Giardia lamlia, Entamoeba histolytica, Trichomonas vaginalis. Um, however, it is carcinogenic, so it's carcinogenesis in humans, or has carcinogenesis in humans, meaning that it makes, genesis makes carcinogens in humans. Um, so it is very dangerous, but again, if we have some of these issues, then we kind of want to balance those. And we can also see that balance when we're talking about dosage, for example. Um, pentamidine, 
This is used for African sleeping sickness, leishmaniasis, and pneumocystis, <clears throat> which is fungus. Um, this can cause pancreatic dysfunction, also liver damage. So again, when we're talking about these drugs, we see a lot more of the side effects when we're talking about these because our cells are so closely aligned with these cells. They're so very similar. Quinolines, these interfere with heme detoxification. So breaking down hemoglobin into amino acids within the red blood cell. Um, so <clears throat> when we have excess hemoglobin and or not access, but when the hemoglobin is, is being used and we're recycling red blood cells and things like that, um, we need to detoxify and our quinolines are going to interfere with that detoxification process. So then of course it's making it toxic for the cell. Uh, these are some of the quinolines used for malaria and our entamoeba histolytica. Long-term use, however, we have hallucinations and cardiac issues. Things, again, um, can become very serious. Uh, when we're talking about our helminths, so our anti-helminthic drugs, again, these can be difficult to develop, but these are even more difficult because when we're talking about um, fungus, we, we kind of have single cells separated. It's not, it's not as much like a mushroom growing inside of the person, um, so it's not multicellular per se. It's usually singular, singular in the body, so it's a little bit easier to attack. Um, same thing with protozoa being single-celled. It's a little bit easier to attack. When we get to anti-helminthic drugs, however, they have to somehow work around the fact that we have an entire multicellular eukaryote inside of a multicellular eukaryote um, and try to kill the one that's inside of the person without killing the person. So again, quite difficult. Um, we have our benzimidazoles, <clears throat> which bind to the helminths beta tubulin, and then this prevents microtubule formation. Um, this is also used for protozoa, for fungi, and for viruses. <clears throat> and we're actually trying to see if it can be used for cancer cells in order to stop mitosis in these cancer cells that are dividing um, too much. However, as we know, there are side effects, uh, liver damage, bone marrow suppression, so decreasing the bone marrow in the body, um, so some serious issues. But this, in this case, is going into effect the microtubules. So again, remember, we already spoke about making microtubules and how we need those microtubules to pull the chromosomes apart during mitosis. So if we don't have that formation, then they're not going to be able to go through mitosis. We have our avermectins. Uh, these block neuron transmission. So it actually causes paralysis in the helminths. And if it causes paralysis, paralysis, then they're not going to be able to eat. And if they're not going to be able to eat, then they starve and they die. Um, and in this case, it's non-toxic to humans. So uh, avermectins can be a very useful tool. Uh, we see these being used in roundworm uh, diseases and parasitic insects. Niclosamide is another one, and it inhibits ATP formation. Uh, it builds in the intestines. So if it's going to inhibit ATP again, then there's a decrease in energy. A decrease in energy means that the organism is not going to continue living. Um, so we've, we use these for tapeworm infections. But it's recently been shown to be antibacterial, antiviral, and has some anti-tumor activity. So research is being done on those things as well. Uh, Praziquantel is another anti-helminthic drug. In this case, what it does is it causes this huge influx of calcium into the worm, um, into the helminth. And when we have a huge influx of calcium, uh, remember, calcium is what is necessary in order to make our muscles move. We are part of the contraction process. So in order, we need calcium because calcium is actually going to allow the one part of the muscle filament to attach to the other part of the muscle filament and then contract. So if we have huge amounts of calcium and we never have that calcium go away, then we have constant contraction. If we have constant contraction, then we end up with these intense spasms and then paralysis. Um, so <clears throat> we have this for parasitic tapeworms, liver flukes, um, especially the blood flukes. It's used for tapeworms um, when niclosamide is causing GI distress. So when it's becoming a problem with GI distress, some intestinal issues, we can switch over to this. Thioxanthinones inhibit our RNA synthesis. So again, getting into the cell and inhibiting RNA synthesis. Um, schistomiasis by S. mansoni only is when we use this. Uh, 
It's being developed, however, for two genera due to increasing resistance to Prisoquanto. Um, so even though Prisoquanto seems pretty great, we have this influx of calcium and causes paralysis. Um, there is resistance being built up just like we see in bacteria. So then we are next going to switch over into our antiviral drugs. So the characteristics of viruses make it difficult to develop drugs with selective toxicity. Um, again, because they are an obligate intracellular pathogen, um, they have to be inside of a cell in order to reproduce per se, um, meaning make copies of itself. And it also has a very simple structure. So there's not a whole lot of different ways that we can kind of attack it because it is such a simple structure. So we have some modes of action. Um, first is inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis. Um, so <clears throat> trying to stop them from making nucleic acids or using or pr the production of nucleic acids so they can't use them to make copies of themselves. Um, inhibiting the escape of the virus from the endosome. So recall that um, some viruses are brought into the cell in an endosome. And then once it gets into the cell in the endosome, that endosome has to be dissolved so that the uh, virus can then be inside of the cell. So some of our modes of action in this case is to prevent that endosome from dissolving and allowing the bacteria or the uh, virus to get into the cell. Also inhibiting neuraminidinase. <laughs> neuraminidase. Um, this is in the case of the flu virus, influenza virus enzyme. So first, let's take a look at a cyclovir, um, also known as Zovirax. So this is a synthetic analog of guanosine. So remember, guanosine is something is um, a part of a nucleotide, right? It's a, a piece of the nucleotide. And so if we're talking about an analog of guanosine, and we're talking about the actual chemical being an analog, then the virus is going to incorporate that instead of what it needs to incorporate. So it's activated by the herpes simplex virus. It's going to be added to the growing DNA strand um, because it looks like guanosine. And then what it does is it actually causes chain termination. So it's going to stop nucleic acid synthesis. So it's going to be trying to make its DNA. The, the virus is trying to make its DNA, but it keeps basically falling apart because it's adding the guanosine um, analog instead of actual guanosine. Uh, as far as specificity, it needs to be activated. <clears throat> so um, that is of benefit because we don't want this getting into all of our cells um, because then our own cells would be stopping DNA synthesis. So it has to be activated. And so we have it activated by the herpes simplex virus. So it's used for our herpes virus infections. Um, <clears throat> and it has an increased affinity by viral DNA polymerase. So our DNA polymerase doesn't grab onto it as much as it would grab onto the actual guanosine, fortunately. Um, and in this case, the viral DNA polymerase happens to grab that more often. It can be used topically or systemically, depending on the type of infection. Uh, side effect, however, is nephrotoxicity. So you can see on the right side here the image of this. On one here, the viral enzymes add a phosphate group to a cyclovir. Um, then in two, the human enzymes add two more phosphate groups, producing a cyclovir uh, triphosphate. This is kind of that activation part that we mentioned. So it, it goes in, and it doesn't just act like itself. It has to be activated by adding these phosphate groups. Then in three, during viral DNA replication, the acyclovir is added to the growing strand rather than GTP. Uh, and then this is going to stop elongation, and then it stops viral replication. Next is ribavirin. <clears throat> this is a guanosine analog also. It interferes with DNA and RNA synthesis, although we are not entirely sure how it is interrupting RNA synthesis. In this case, um, it's used for treatment for RNA viruses because it does interrupt RNA synthesis. So for example, uh, hepatitis C virus, um, oftentimes along with interferon, and we'll talk about that, um, and respiratory succinctal virus. Side effects are anemia, developmental defects in an unborn child if someone takes it while pregnant, um, because again, it, it's decreasing RNA synthesis. It's affecting RNA and DNA synthesis in this case. <clears throat> Sophosbuvir Sophos is the next one, or Sovaldi. This is a uridine analog, so this interferes with the viral polymerase activity. So in this case, we're using uridine. 
Um, and then similarly, it's an analog, so it's going to grab onto this instead of grabbing onto what it needs to. Uh, often, often administered with ribavirin, uh, with and without interferon. Um, the next ones are amantadine and rimantadine. So these bind to a transmembrane protein that's involved in the escape of the virus from the endosome. So this is one of the, the modes um, that we were talking about where recall that the virus comes in in kind of its own bubble, its own vesicle, which is the endosome, and then it has to be released from that endosome. In this case, it bind, these bind to the transmembrane protein, the protein that's across the plasma membrane that's involved in releasing that virus into the cell. Um, so what it does then is it's blocking the release of that viral RNA into the host cell, and it blocks viral replication. However, there is an increase in resistance to these drugs um, because it's been used a lot for influenza A, um, so it's not working as effectively. Side effects can be neurological. <clears throat> uh, due to the effects on the brain chemicals like dopamine and MDA, and MDA uh, they are used for treatments of for Parkinson's disease. So that's being looked at more closely um, because it is affecting our brain chemicals. As you can see, some of the side effects are neurological side effects. Um, so that's actually being looked at to treat Parkinson's. Next is what we often think of as Tamiflu um, and then also Xanamivir, uh, which is Relenza and Permavir or Paramivir, sorry. Um, these are going to block the activity of the influenza virus. Um, so influenza virus neuraminidinase, this prevents the release of the virus from the infected cells. So um, rather than affecting the endosome and not letting it into the cell um, by keeping it in the endosome, in this case, the cell is, or the virus is still getting into the cell, it's still replicating, but it's blocking the ability for the virus to get out of the cell and go and infect other cells. Um, so this actually helps to decrease flu symptoms and shorten the illness because it's not actually going in and killing the different viruses, killing per se, um, but what it's doing is it's stopping their release, and if we're stopping their release, then the body or the immune system can get rid of the viruses that are there outside of those cells, uh, and then we can get rid of the illness faster. Um, some of these are taken orally or inhaled or intravenously, <clears throat> and at this point, resistance is still relatively minimal. Uh, there is some that we have that are under development, um, like pl Placonaril. Uh, Placonaril is for life-threatening complications of enteroviruses, so meningitis, uh, sepsis, and also for polio. In this case, it's binding to the capsid, and then it's preventing that uncoding of the viral particles inside the host cell. So if you remember some of the videos where the, the virus comes into the cell, oftentimes it has the endosome, the endosome has to go away, and then we have the capsid, the capsid breaks away, and then the RNA or the DNA is going to get into the cell to start replication. In this case, uh, the endosome may still go away, um, but in this case, it's binding to that capsid, and it prevents the uncoding of that. So now we're going to take a look at some really difficult or very complex viral life cycles and how we can try to affect those. Specifically, we're going to look at retroviruses. So, for example, retroviral HIV. Um, recall that our HIV, since it is a retrovirus, what it does is it has RNA as its nucleic acid, and it uses reverse transcriptase to reverse transcribe from RNA to DNA, and then it's going to make a second side or the opposite side complementary base pair, um, the DNA, to make a double strand of DNA. It's then able to take that double strand of DNA and integrate itself into the cell's DNA. And therefore, then we have a lifelong um, process. It's a chronic illness because it is actually inside of the cell's DNA. And then when that cell goes through the division process, it makes more cells with the DNA in it as well. So <clears throat> when we take a look at making antivirals for retrovirals, um, what we want to try to do is Remember that our retroviral HIV targets the CD4 uh, receptor on our white blood cells. <clears throat> so it targets the CD4 positive white blood cells, and it's necessary for a healthy immune system. So we have to have our CD4 white blood cells, or our, our white blood cells that have the CD4 receptor on them. Now, 
So then we're left with trying to figure out a way to get rid of these retroviruses. <clears throat> so our HIV reverse transcriptase, if we remember, it does lack a proofreading ability. So this makes it actually even more difficult to try to find a way to get rid of these viruses because we um, have a difficult time trying to nail down the actual RNA and therefore the DNA that the virus is making because it lacks this proofreading ability, it introduces mutations often. And since it introduces mutations often, uh, then there's rapid development of drug resistance. So as soon as we can kind of nail down the RNA or the DNA that's made from the RNA from the HIV and make some sort of antiviral against it, um, oftentimes it's already gone and mutated, you know, multiple times or mutated enough to make that no longer useful. Um, so then there's a resistance to that. Uh, we do have antiretroviral therapy, ART, which is a combination of specific antiviral drugs that help to prevent resistance. So um, we have kind of this cocktail, as it's called, of different drugs to try to attack this HIV virus. So if we take a look at this, this is showing um, one of our immune system cells, so a CD4 cell. And what we see here is HIV is up here. This is our immune system cell. We have HIV. You can see that it's, it's showing here how that's attaching. We have our uh, receptors over here. It's actually showing and labeling the receptors. Here's our CD4 receptor and our CCR5 co-receptor. Remember, it has to attach both to the CD4 receptor and the CCR5 receptor in order to be let into the cell. Um, so if it's going to attach, it can be let into the cell. So we can kind of see that that's happening here. Our virus attaches, it's let into the cell, it releases its viral RNA. <clears throat> now, when we are looking at different mechanisms, we're going to try to attack here at the reverse transcriptase level here. That's why there's an X here. So we have um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors that are trying to stop that process from making DNA. We also then have integrase inhibitors. <clears throat> And the integrase inhibitors, as you know, their the name implies, is going to inhibit them from integrating the DNA if it's gotten past the um, reverse transcriptase piece, prevent it from integrating into the host DNA, and then also over here on the right hand side we have protease inhibitors. Um, so those proteins that are going to be made um, or repackaged here, you can see at this point what we've done is if we get past these other steps per se and then the DNA is incorporated when it's making copies of itself, then we have protease inhibitors to try to prevent those proteins that make up the virus from being made and then therefore being, making new viruses and being um, sent out to infect more cells. So in our antiretroviral therapy, as we mentioned, we have reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So this is going to block that RNA conversion to DNA. So it binds to reverse transcriptase, and then it's going to cause an inactivating conformational change. So basically what that means is that we have our reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It's going to attach to reverse transcriptase and then kind of tweak it or bend it a little bit to where it doesn't work anymore. Um, so it's going to inactivate it by making a change in the shape. Um, so AZT is what this is called here. Uh, this is our competitive nucleoside analog inhibitors. Um, so in this case, nucleoside analog. So again, we're, we're making something that looks like a nucleoside to make a nucleotide to make DNA. Um, so this is competitive. So it will grab onto this um, AZT as, instead of the nucleoside it needs. Um, so we stop DNA synthesis that way. Um, etravirine is another one. It's a non-nucleoside, non-competitive inhibitor. Um, so it's not related to the nucleoside, and it's also not competitive, but it's going to inhibit uh, this reverse transcriptase or this um, conversion from RNA to DNA. Then we have the protease inhibitors, ritonavir or alicio. Uh, ritonavir is going to block the processing of viral proteins and prevents the viral maturation. So remember with HIV, it kind of puts all of the different proteins together, puts them in their envelope and ships them out. But even when they're being shipped out, sent out into the rest of the body, they still have some further maturation that needs to happen. And so the ritonavir is going to block that processing, but then also block that maturation process. So then when it does get to another cell, 
hopefully then it's not going to be able to infect the cell because it is not um, mature, and so it cannot do that. Alisio is being developed for other viral types, um, currently for hepatitis C um, with some of these other ones. Remember, we have our integrase inhibitors, mm -hmm. so we are stopping that integration of the DNA in our DNA. Um, Rot uh, Roltegravir is going to block that activity. Uh, we have fusion inhibitors, uh, and fuveritide is what is preventing the merging of that viral envelope with the host cell membrane. Um, so recall that HIV is a, a membranous viral, uh, virus, so it has a membrane on it or a viral envelope. And then when it merges, and it, it merges with our plasma membrane, um, this fusion inhibitor is going to stop that from happening, so stop it from fusing. And then we have CCR5 antagonists as well. So CCR5 antagonists are going to prevent the binding of HIV to that co-receptor, the CCR5 co-receptor, um, so not allowing it to come into the cell at all. So again, here's kind of our summary here of our different modes, our main modes here. Um, and I missed this before when I was saying them in general, our fusion inhibitors there. And then we also have our CCR5, um, where we're preventing CCR5 from being attached to by the HIV virus. <clears throat> so you should be familiar with all of these different antivirals. You should be familiar with all of the different antimicrobials, um, but understand how they work, where they work, um, and what they are.